now we will have Gujan Sharma from Illinois Institute of Technology talking about DP coloring of Cartesian products of graphs. Take it away. Thank you. And thank you everybody for being here today. So as the title suggests, uh, my talk is about DP coloring of Cartesian product of graphs. And it is something that I've been working on a paper about with uh, my, okay, uh, my research advisor among others. And this is a joint work with Himanshu Kaul. He's my uh, research advisor, Jeffrey Mudrock. He's his former student and he works at uh, College of Lake, Lake County now and Queen, Queen Stratton. He's uh, one of my fellow PhD uh, student actually, and not my student, but uh, we both were Professor Cole students. Okay, so first we need some basic definitions which you might already be familiar about, but nonetheless, we need to go through them first. So first definition is graph coloring. So in which, uh, in which actually, what is graph coloring? It is to assign colors to the vertices of a graph so that two vertices with an edge between them receive different colors. So that's it. So it's very straightforward. And the minimum number of colors you can do this with is called the uh, chromatic number of that graph G. And it is uh, denoted by this symbol right here. It's called chi of G. Now moving on to coloring number. And it is the smallest number K such that we can find an ordering of the vertices of graph G such that each vertex has at most K minus one neighbors before it that appears in that ordering. So here is an example of a complete bipartite graph K24. And this actually demonstrates, there might be different orderings, but this is the one that specifically demonstrates where it achieves that coloring number of that um, of K24 is three. And we have that naive bound on the chromatic polynomial, uh, sorry, chromatic number of a graph. It is upper bounded by coloring number of G. And the basic argument, the naive argument about this is just at each point, you just greedily color with the available color. And uh, you can always do that with coloring number of G since it has at most K minus one neighbors preceding it. So you are always left with one color. Okay, so now the list coloring sister of uh, our usual graph coloring. So the only difference is we are still properly coloring a graph, uh, but we now each vertex is assigned a certain list. So that, and that assigning we call a list assignment. Uh, we can denote it by L. And if each list assignment L has the same size for each vertex, we call that a K assignment if that size is K. So here is an example. So this is a two assignment of a copy of C3. Here is another two assignment of a copy of C3. And uh, if we if if we can color the graph color the graph with this list as list assignment, then we say that G is L colorable. So if we call this list assignment like the one where I'm hovering my mouse over L1, and suppose this is L2, so we can say that this copy of C3 is L1 colorable but not L2 colorable. Okay, so now uh, what is the list chromatic number? So we've already discussed the chromatic number. So it's list coloring analog is list, color, uh, list chromatic number. It is the smallest K such that G is L colorable for every K assignment L. And this is an example that shows, this is actually bad list assignment that shows that uh, the list chromatic number of K24 has to be at least three. So no matter the way you, no matter how you choose the colors, you always run into problems with coloring with this list. And uh, list chromatic number works as an upper bound on chromatic number or for any graph. And these can be actually same for several categories of graphs, but as Eric, Eric already mentioned in his talk, uh, the difference between these two can be arbitrarily large for some categories of graphs. Okay, so now like things are a little different and now we're moving to DP coloring. So what, what is the intuition behind DP coloring? And it was actually introduced by Dvorak and Postel in 2015 when they were actually working on a list coloring problem of planar graphs. Uh, so suppose we have a list assignment of a graph. Here's a copy of C3 again. So let us call this list assignment L. And you And if we change this problem so that the finding of an L coloring of this graph is equivalent to finding an independent set of a certain size in an auxiliary graph. 
So we'll define that auxiliary graph, what is that? So suppose this is an L assignment of C3, and uh, suppose corresponding to each vertex, we blow that vertex up into a clique of size of the list of that vertex. So the list of each vertex in this case is just two. So for corresponding to each vertex here, we have a clique. So these uh, ovals are actually not present in the graph. So these are just for visual aid. And uh, we have an edge between the vertices in that auxiliary graph whenever we have a matching color. So this is the corresponding auxiliary graph as we, uh, we have described corresponding to this list assignment. So it kind of the list uh, coloring quite easily generalizes to DP coloring. But not only that, we so now we need to study other aspects of DP coloring as well. So in general DP coloring, uh, the intuition is consider the worst case scenario of how many colors we need in each list and we can no longer see the see the labels. So now we no longer know that this is one, this is two, this is three and so on. And we just have matchings between these blobs here. And uh, so that is the study of DP coloring. So that is the basic intuition. We will need some definitions. So uh, we start with what is the cover of a graph? Here's the technical definition, which I'm not going to discuss here, but I'll just again set the intuition. Uh, as I already mentioned in previous slide, so blow up each vertex of G into a clique size of its corresponding list size, and then add matchings whenever uh, between two vertices in G there is an edge. And in H graph, that is the, uh, this is actually, it's a pair, uh, the cover graph script H is a pair L of L and H. L is just the list assignment, H is that corresponding graph. And in, in the graph H, these uh, aforementioned uh, matchings can be actually empty. Okay, so, and whenever for each vertex, the list size is same, say M, we call that cover an M fold cover. Uh, it's very analogous to what is a K assignment. Uh, so here's an example of complete bipartite graph K13 and a two fold cover uh, of K13. Okay, so now moving on to uh, like here's the, like what is the DP chromatic number of a graph? So, okay, so before that, what we need to understand is when we say there is an edge coloring of a graph. So given a cover, and give it, uh, and that is a that is a cover of graph G. We say that G has an H coloring, as I mentioned already. If we can find an independent set in H, now the new information is is all, it, that set should be of size of order of G. So, and the DP chromatic number is the smallest M such that G admits an H coloring, which means there exists an H coloring of G for every M fold cover H of G which is very analogous to what we did in list coloring. So uh, very, very similar. And this example actually demonstrates that uh, this is a like good, good fold, uh, good uh, two fold cover of C4. And this is the bad two fold cover of C4. And this demonstrates that since we have a bad two fold cover C4, this means that the DP chromatic number of C4 is at least three. And uh, very interestingly, the way we have uh, we have edges among these uh, vertices here, in, in this case, for every proper coloring of C4, we have an H1 coloring of C4. So this, this cover is H1, uh, which is not the case in, H, in H2. And here's the relation between the various chromatic numbers that we have discussed and the coloring number and then the, sorry, uh, Delta of G is the maximum degree of graph G and that plus one X is then upper bound on all of those numbers. Okay, so now we are moving to the interesting stuff like counting the number of proper colorings or number of list colorings or number of DP colorings. So as we already know, we might, not, we might know that uh, chromatic polynomial of G denoted by P of G comma M for parameter M, it equals the number of proper colorings of G with M colors. And its list coloring analog is actually the list color function. It might not be a polynomial. And that is a minimum number of list colorings over all possible M assignments L of G. And its DP coloring analog is the DP color function. 
It is a minimum value, very similar to list coloring. It, the definition very uh, clearly generalizes. This is the minimum value of all possible H colorings over all possible M fold covers H of G. And here are some examples that demonstrate, particularly, for example, if you see this example and this one, these value can be same. But if you see this one here, we know that chromatic polynomial of a K24 is at least one, but uh, the corresponding list color function of that same graph is zero. So they can be, uh, the difference between them can be strict. Okay, so how DP color function might be different? This slide demonstrates just that. So we have this inequality among uh, the DP, uh, uh, the chromatic polynomial and list and DP uh, color functions. So this theorem tells us that list, uh, chromatic polynomial and list color function, they become eventually equal for large values of M. But for, in case of DP coloring, the difference between these two quantities can be strict when we have, uh, when we have uh, graphs with even girth. And in fact, we have this result that, tell, that tells us that for every girth, at least three, we can find a graph for which eventually the difference is strict. So this is just to demonstrate that how different things are with list coloring and DP coloring. Okay, so now we are, because we are studying Cartesian products, so uh, I'll not be again discussing the technical definition, but just imagine that for a, if we have a Cartesian product of two graphs G and H, we have corresponding to each vertex in G, we have a copy of H and corresponding to each vertex in H, we have a copy of G just like that, just like this picture here. So we have this grid-like structure in Cartesian products. So here's an example of C5, uh, Cartesian product of C5 and P3. Okay, so now we are going to learn about uh, the coloring Cartesian product of graphs. Here is the, uh, like this might, you, you might have already come across this result. So this is, this is actually equal, um, what is the chromatic number of Cartesian product of graphs? And in 2006, uh, Boroki and others, they gave an upper bound on list chromatic number of Cartesian product of graphs. And th our first result from that paper is actually just the uh, generalization of, of this result in context of DP coloring. Now, taking a step back, going to the list coloring, uh, when Boroki uh, and among others, they, they gave this result in 2006 to show that this bound is tight. They gave an example when H is complete by apartheid graph and this bound is actually attainable whenever we have B large enough. And in 2018, Jeffrey uh, Madrock and Hyun Shu Kaul, they improved on this bound. Uh, as you can see, this quantity is it's smaller than this one, whenever G has an edge, that is. Okay. So we are taking Colin Madrock's 2018 result and uh, taking actually inspiration from that, we were able to generalize this in, in case of DP coloring as well. So we have very analogous result here. So uh, uh, our older result is attainable. The upper bound is attainable whenever we have, we have B large enough, but, this, but the surprising thing is we can bound this in terms of the DP color function. So that was quite interesting. And this result is actually sharp when we have G as an even cycle and the complete bipartite graph that, that is the second factor in the Cartesian product, it is a star. So we have sharp result in that case. Okay, so uh, we don't have time to go through the proof idea, but if someone has questions that we can come to this slide for visual aids. So uh, that, that's what the purpose of that slide is. Okay, coming to, to the sharpness result. So this is what we just saw in the previous slide. And interestingly, the only, uh, when we have list size at least two, the only bad covers corresponding to even cycles look like this. And the only bad covers corresponding to all cycles look exactly like this, when we have list sizes at least two. So this is one of the tools that we developed among others to prove these results. And also one more thing, uh, as you can see that for odd cycles, we obtain the upper bound uh, quicker than we do for uh, even cycles. So that is an interesting fact there. 
Okay. And also, uh, uh, okay, so in previous cases, our second factor was a star. So now you're wondering that, can we do some, can we improve on that bound for general K? So we were able to do that. We still don't have sharp result, but we were able to improve upon that bound and we presented uh, a probabilistic argument to prove these actually. So uh, this is the one for even cycles. No, this is the one for odd cycles and this is the one for odd cy uh, even cycles. And here's a summary of the results once again, and then And thank you for listening to me. Any questions? Uh, thank you so much. Let's all take a moment to thank the speaker for our, uh, the wonderful talk. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions? And sorry about going like fast. <laughs> I, I had to do that in 15 minutes. So I hope you understand. And if uh, like, uh, this is an open question that I would like, like to ask you guys. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So I have, <clears throat> I have a question. Um, I believe in your abstract, you said something about new techniques. Can you just, I, I know that the, the proof, it looked a lot, comp, uh, it looked pretty complicated, but I'm just wondering like what, technique are you referring to here as a, a new technique that you use to prove these? Yeah, so as I mentioned, like among other tools, so the, we develop new tools and techniques to uh, help us these, uh, like prove these results. So one, uh, so I'm not given the formal definitions here. So one such technique is, we call this labeling of vertices, uh, a canonical labeling. And uh, this is a canonical labeling and this is a twisted canonical labeling. And this is some. This is one of the tools that we use to show these results. And another thing is, we we can define an equivalence relation uh, when we have a canonical labeling on the proper colorings of a graph. And since, uh, if you recall, I mentioned that in case of C C four, we have a proper coloring for every proper coloring of C four. We have an H one coloring of C four. So we were able to. Uh, define an equivalence relation on the proper colorings of C4. And in turn, we could define an equivalence relation on proper H colorings or H1 colorings in this case uh, of C4. So we, we could use that equivalence relation stuff. And one more thing we used was volatile coloring, something called volatile coloring, which again, I did not have time to include the formal definition. And also it comes uh, in the proof idea, uh, but uh, just to give a, give you an intuition, just imagine that we have a copy of uh, G here, a copy of G here. Imagine we have edges uh, among the vertices of this copy with with rest of the copy of covers of G in such a way that whatever is remaining, whatever non-neighbors of the uh, edges before it, whatever remains, does not have a have a proper H coloring. I'm saying H in quotes because it might it might have a different name, H coloring or H1 coloring, whatever. So in in a certain sense, these uh, these matchings or these edges leave that copy uh, non H colorable. So we call those uh, colorings volatile colorings. Does it make sense? Like it's a lot to take in, like uh, because we will need a like proper definition and so. Mm -hmm. But yeah, among other tools, uh, equivalence uh, relation stuff, canonical labeling, twisted canonical labeling, and volatile coloring were some of the tools that we used. Okay. Does cool. that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I hope I did not confuse you even more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I had a very, very quick, small question. So coverings, looking at matchings and TP, DP colorings, looking at independent sets, all this seems to be borrowing a lot of the terminology used to discuss matroids. So I'm curious if there is a deeper connection going on between DP coloring and matroids. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. But I would like to explore That's... it if there is. Yeah, no, it sounds fascinating. Definitely feels like there's something going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Let's all thank the speaker one more time. Thank you.